Okay. Um, Jerome, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, what I want to do is just say a little bit about you for the for the listeners uh, or people who are watching the video. And and then and then I've got a pile of questions to uh, to put to you. So obviously the hook for today's conversation is is category creation. I, I've read your book on category creation, which uh, I really think is is extremely compelling. And I think it's the first thing that has really pulled together not just like a high level overview of category creation, but also really gets into the, some of the nuts and bolts of that. Um, I hope you won't mind me saying if people go to jeromepinot.com, they can get a copy of that for free from the website at the moment. Hopefully, yep. it'll continue to be to be generous uh, uh, to be generous with that. And I think this whole approach of of of, of category creation for AR, which I know you've embedded in in your CCAR methodology, your CCAR business, uh, is something that I think is really introducing a, a novel approach to analyst relations, which, you know, it maybe shouldn't even be that novel. You know, we've been talking about category creation as a community of practice for decades, and it's a bit weird, actually. It's a bit remiss of us as a community that this gap exists and, and that you're, you're filling this gap now rather than others having, having worked on it. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure. Pleasure, Duncan. Thanks for having me, and uh, let's uh, happy to get going. Well, I want I want to start off with maybe what, what could perhaps be a bit of a naive question. We talk a lot about category creation. What is a category? I mean, what, what what are we talking about when we're talking about categories? What does that what does that really mean, especially in an analyst relations context? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, a category, uh, you know, generically speaking, is just the way the human brain works, right? When people think about things, they need to categorize them. You know, you're you're going to a dentist or you're going to a bank, you know, what's the category there? And then you can get more specific. But specifically in terms of, you know, technology and AR as a whole, uh, a category is just a, a market. Basically, it's a definition of a market, a specific type of market in the, you know, technology market services market or, or something to that effect uh, that's out there uh, that's covered by uh, typically by uh, by analysts and analyst firms. Uh, great examples for that would be uh, ERP and CRM, for example. So those are two categories that were defined, uh, you know, many decades ago by, uh, you know, by uh, Gartner, among other folks. Um, and that's what a category is. And then What's the most favorable outcome of category creation? You know, if I think in particular what we're talking about is not just fitting into a category, but of of, of innovating a category. Yeah. So what are the benefits of that? Yeah. So when businesses create their own categories, basically they're doing a couple of things. Um, what they're really, really doing is saying, hey, you know what? Um, I would love to be different versus uh, to be competing. Um, so really category creation, category design is about um, defining, creating demand versus fighting for existing demand. So the benefit of this um, has been well proven over the years. Uh, there's a book out there called Play Bigger, which is one of the Bibles of category creation. Uh, its authors conducted some pretty extensive research years ago and determined that the category creators, the, the, the companies and the brands that define categories, create categories, uh, pretty much take 76% of the value of the market. So if you take the, 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 the sum of, you know, the, the, the market value of public companies, uh, the assessed values of private companies, you take that whole thing, you sum it up, 76% of that goes to the category creator. So who's a category creator? Uh, names we all know and love for many years. We probably don't remember that they were category creators, but they certainly uh, were when they, you know, when they started out. You know, I'm thinking of Netflix, Amazon, uh, Salesforce in the tech space uh, around CRM and SaaS is, is, is one of the quintessential examples of category creators. Uh, they're basically a market of one or maybe, you know, a market of two or three, um, but they own the category. They are the first folks who basically um, framed, named, and claimed the problem, uh, a point of view around solving the problem, and therefore people naturally uh, gravitate to these, to these companies um, when they're looking for a solution to the problem that they have. 
it's just an automatic psychological reaction and it's 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 impossible to compete with these folks afterwards once you once you own the category once you own that market once you define and create it uh you're pretty much set for life in it and and, and we see this you know i mean you think obviously again you know you, you look at airbnb you look at netflix you look at amazon who you know salesforce who is going you know who's positioned to to defeat those folks and uh, and compete with them pretty much nobody Sorry, Duncan, it looks like you're muted. I am. Um, so is is a new category generally then the, the white space between the markets that are around you or between the providers that you're currently uh, competing with or, or is there more to it? I think there's. It, it's, a, it's possible that it might start off this way, um, but I think generally it's not about filling a gap. It's really about you know, it's it's a new curve, it's a new model, it's a new way of thinking about things. Um, so I don't think it's so much about white space as, as something that's completely different, um, really, I think. Um, you know, so it doesn't mean like if you're a category creator, it doesn't mean that you're, you know, that you're that you don't belong in, in that you don't possibly belong in adjacent categories, right? Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, it's a new it's a new world you're defining out there, a new way of thinking. So I don't think it's it's really about white space and gaps so much as it is about like um, you know innovation and, and and a brand new way of of looking at life in general. And. I think very often when I get into, I mean, maybe this is just my pain and my experience, but very often when I get into conversations about category creation, actually, people aren't starting from very much a, a new mindset, but actually from an old mindset that's really geared around uh, evaluative reports, you know, these these Forrester Waves and Gartner Magic Quadrants, that very often people are saying um, our business would be much more successful if there was a, a defined market category evaluative report. That was comparing us and our competition. There isn't one at the moment that decelerates our success. How can we get one of those made? And uh, it's a bit of a rhetorical question, but you know, is that um, is that is that the best way to start thinking about how how category creation can can work? Yeah, <laughs> great question. Um, I actually, I'm, I'm going to turn that on its head. Actually, Duncan, I'm going to say that the the right way to think about category creation from an AR perspective. Uh, from the get-go is to actually not think at all about reports, right? Because by definition, when you're in a new category, uh, you know, ecosystem, when you're when you're defining the category, you're not going to find reports around it. You're not going to find research around it because it's brand new. Nobody's ever thought of it before, right? So, so, so trying to figure out, you know, where the reports are is not going to work for you. And category creation is is a marathon. You know, typically, I think in the Play Bigger book. Uh, if I recall correctly, uh, they talk about an 18 to 36 months endeavor just to get, you know, a foothold in the market. Um, so, you know, in the best case scenario, eventually at the end of the day, there will be a report for it, but initially there won't be. And and it's a bit of a it's a bit of a moot point to try and immediately get analysts to jump up and say, oh, you know, oh, you're right, my God, why didn't I see this for the last 20 years? This is a new category. Uh, and I'm going to write a report about it. That's simply not going to happen. So you can't really go about it that way. And I, I think, you know, reports and magic quadrants and waves, um, they're just not going to be there. And, and you know, that's that's part of the reason I, you know, I started thinking about this CCAR, uh, you know, approach to, to supporting category creation. Um, because initially, analyst relations is about, you know, you know, industry analysts, they support or they research uh, and they talk about existing categories and category creation, there's no category. So how do you, you know, how do you tackle that problem, which is what CCAR is all about. And and what's what's driving people there? I mean, uh, there must be a whole series of kind of business challenges and use cases in a way that bring people into this category creation uh, work. Can can you spell spell out some of the uh, things that are bringing people into the into this activity around category creation? Yeah, I, I think well, quite frankly, in my experience, a lot of time it, it's by accident. Like all of a sudden, um, you know, a company or, or a brand will will sort of miraculously, in a way, have a come to Jesus moment and discover, like, oh my God, there's 
This is a massive problem that either nobody or the market isn't aware of it, or they're not aware of any solution that can fix the problem. If you think about Uber, for example, that's a perfect example, right? And so a lot of times it starts, you know, from a startup perspective, somebody wants to fix a problem that they themselves have. Uh, and they're looking from an outside in perspective and looking at, you know, what's going on, what's affecting the market, what's the, what's the real pain point in the market uh, that's going on and, and, and frame the problem, name the problem, and then claim, you know, the solution to the problem with a very uh, specific, well articulated point of view that says, hey, this is how we're going to go from the problem to the solution, from the old way of doing things to the new way of doing and thinking about things. Um, and, and so they and so they kind of make that intellectual jump, if you want. Um, it, it's a difficult one. I mean, quite frankly, you know, it's I think it's human nature. You want to stay, uh, you know, you want to have stability. Uh, change is painful. Change is scary, right? And uh, category creation is painful and scary. Uh, but the rewards of it, as I mentioned earlier, are so tremendous that it makes you know absolute business and strategic sense to consider it. Uh, when you're actually on to something uh, worthwhile, I think. And right now, I mean, we're, we're speaking in January 2023. Right now, we're seeing a lot of kind of macroeconomic and, and political instability. Do you think this is accelerating or, or, or attenuating the, right. the push towards category creation? I, I, I think it's, an, you know, the macroeconomics that we're going through these days is a great accelerator. Why? Because, you know, in, in tough times, demand simply plummets. So now you're, you know, you're fighting in the same, you know, in a, in a competitive environment, you're, you're in the ring, you're fighting for a diminishing demand. So it's kind of a race to the bottom in many ways. And I think that's why a lot of companies and uh, a lot of business leaders are thinking, that, okay, we can't just be competing in this, you know, in, in these times, we really need to start creating and owning something new, because that's where the, that's where the, the ROI is really. Competitions are raced to the bottom in, a, in bad economic times quite frankly. So I think it's an accelerator, if anything else, if nothing else. One of, one of the things that I think marks out your book from other things that certainly I and others have written of category, about category creation is the way that you really start to dig into some of the mechanics of it. Like what, what are the actual processes uh, that you that, that you engage in when you are convincing the analysts. And I, I think it's very useful to talk about that in two ways, actually, both in terms of like, what is it you're doing to the analyst, but then also what are the benefits you get from that? You know, it change, you're learning from that as soon as, you, as soon as you engage in that. And that can even change what you do in the second or third interaction when you're, when you're speaking to analysts. But where do companies start out when they want to explore, test, present ideas for, for new categories with industry analysts? Yeah, so, I, you know, the way I describe the, the, the approach is basically, you know, from a CCAR perspective, there's three things that are at play here. Number one is de-risking the category design category creation initiative. The second thing is about informing and gathering insights from the analyst. And the third one is about amplification of your point of view and your problem statement. So I, I think that's where the analysts come in. Uh, the idea is not to, you know, it's a fantasy to think you're going to be able to miraculously convince, you know, seasoned analysts that there's a new category and they should write a report about it. So the approach I like to to um, to suggest is more about, you know, using them to as consultants to actually help you, you know, frame the problem, describe the point of view, run this by them, and at the very initial stages, so that you de-risk it, right? Because the risk with category creation is, hey, you're wrong. This, is not, this isn't a really a new category. It's, you know, maybe a, a gap in an existing category or the market, you know, doesn't really reflect your, your, your point of view. And so it's important to immediately hit up the analyst from the get go and say, hey, this is what we're thinking. This is what, you know, th this is what we're, we're, we're proposing. Does that make sense to you, Mr. or Mrs. Analyst? Are you seeing this problem in the market? What do you think about our point of view? Can you help us design it? Does this make sense? Are we are we on the right tracks or not? So that's that's kind of the first step I suggest that category creators do in terms of of, of um, you know using analysts to, to to do that. And then the other part is about informing, so using them for for advisory uh, purposes. You know, as you develop the point of view, um, using them to you know uh, gauge the size of the potential market. 
you know, if you want to create a, you know, if you're going to create a category, what size market are you going to, you know, does it represent? Do the analysts concur with you on that? Does it make sense? And then lastly, you know, the analysts eventually, you know, maybe you're going to be in a cool vendor on the Gartner side. Maybe you're going to be part of a research uh, paper that they're doing. Maybe they're going to talk about your category and it's associated semantics and taxonomy uh, in a report or a blog of some sorts. That's going to give you a category, you know, share of voice and amplification in the market. So those are the three key points, I think, that, um, you know, makes CCAR valuable. You know, at the end of the day, category creation, uh, at least according to the, the folks that play bigger, you know, there's category, there's, there, there are three pillars you really need to get right uh, when you're doing category creation. It, it's the, you know, category design, product design, and company design. Those three, those three um, sides of the triangle um, are things that analysts can help you with. They can certainly, you know, help you with, you know, designing the product, you know, analyzing your your roadmap, uh, giving you insight and, and feedback on that. Uh, obviously, about the category uh, design itself, the point of view, as I mentioned earlier, and then the company from a go-to-market perspective, and even the way the company is structured, and um, and and uh, you know, talks with its employees or convinces its employees. These are things that analysts can certainly um, help you. Uh, leverage and, and one thing well i don't know if this is a question but it's an observation but i think one of the things that comes out in, in your approach there is very much that 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 when you're speaking to analysts you're using them as a partner in defining this you know you, yes. you're not like some kind of god on a crane in a greek drama like sweeping sweeping down with a uh, pretending that you know better than the analysts and you've got this right pre-fixed idea of what the market is, but actually you and they are testing against, you are testing with each other in the conversation, your ideas about where this opportunity is and where, where, this, might, where this might evolve. Yep. Um, I, I think there's an aspect to this though, that, that you're talking about like changing the way that you describe the market, changing the opportunity that the company's responding to. And some people inside the provider, inside the vendor might get a bit fearful. Uh, about that, yeah. I'm reminded of this line, you know, ships are safe in the harbor, but they are made for the for the open sea. So, what what are your thoughts about the kind of internal struggles that that might open up when yeah. you know vendors, providers, uh, consultancies, whatever, when they are just deciding whether or not to take and take this turn, and when they're deciding how to use the feedback that they get from the analysts. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great question. And I, I love your boat analogy because category creation in many ways is about actually burning the boats. <laughs> you know, there's there's really very little opportunity to walk it back. So uh, from an internal perspective, you know, uh, it's really about change management. Uh, it's really about um, enlisting everybody <clears throat> in the company around a new religion because category creation is very much like religion and every employee Every member, every part of the uh, of the team needs to be involved in, uh, in in evangelizing it. First of all, in believing it. Uh, so that means there's you have, there's a you know you, you you need to convince your own folks that uh, that it's a worthwhile endeavor, uh, and make sure that uh, every you know every part of the business is well coordinated and well um, poised to work together. Because category creation requires every uh, every bit and piece of the business to work together, not only in in conceiving the category and talking about it and developing language around it, but even you know as important, if not more, uh, you know later down the line when you do lightning strikes, right, which are big big um, you know marketing pushes to the world, uh, heralding the new category. Uh, that's when that's when the internals of the business, all the gears of the business, really have to be well oiled and 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 operate together. So yes, this is a big uh, big change management effort there, uh, and a big uh, internal evangelization effort uh, because people don't naturally necessarily jump on board and 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 think, oh yeah, this is great. We should go about doing this, and uh, you know the category makes sense. So there's there's a lot of socializing that needs to be done, uh, and, and from the CEO actually, from the from the very top levels of of the company leadership. In my experience. I, I think there's something kind of interesting embedded in in that in, in that phrase lightning strike in the analogy of the lightning strike 
that there's that there is something there that is uh, it's fundamental, it's decisive, it's visible from from a long way, uh, and the um, it's not exactly a matter of shock and awe, but the the fact of it is that it's a big signal both internally and externally, doesn't yep. it? Yeah. So when you're doing this, you have to align resources internally, Absolutely. and in the process of trying to win and align that probably identify some some caution, some obstruction, some misunderstanding inside the organization. Yeah? So this process of like preparing and winning the argument about the about the, the new category is something that is actually ongoing, not only through its design, but even through the execution of it. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and actually uh, one of the things that uh, where CCAR comes in uh, you know importantly is uh, preparing or or not preparing but i mean collaborating with the analysts around developing the lightning strikes especially in you know thinking about you know how can the analysts be involved before during and after the strike and it's very important for them to be involved in uh, in those i believe yeah as as is it's very important for them to be involved in everything uh, you know as as we discussed earlier uh but especially with lightning strikes definitely uh don't forget about leveraging the analysts for those I, I could imagine it could be especially important that in the same way that you might have caution inside the supplier organization that the provider might be you know quite concerned about moving away from a, an existing well-defined analyst from a well-defined uh, category again you have some analysts who will think that the rise of a new category is in their interest they can fasten themselves to it this can be the rising tide that they that they lift on there may be others who might also be threatened by the by the rise of a new of a new category unless you're able to incorporate with them explain with them help them prepare themselves and their colleagues or their research their clients for the for the, for the development of this new of this new category there's a, it reminds me a little bit of a phrase that, that, that I've heard you use in the in in the past that if you if you don't have competitors trying to penetrate a new category, then you're not in a market. You're in a dreamland. Yeah? And I, think, <laughs> yeah. I think that I think that points to the way that a category is not just a space, but it's a tool that that you are working with others to co-create. Yeah, you uh, others have to be drawn towards it otherwise no life is going to be yeah. is going to breathe into it can can yeah. you can you say a little bit more about like well what do you what do you mean about this and i suppose how can people tell if they're sleepwalking into a dreamland right or, right. or if they're creating something that really seems to have value even to their competitors right well hopefully you've you've uh dismissed the uh the dreamland aspect by de-risking initially with the analysts as we were just talking about earlier huh. um, but i think you know one of the clear first signs of success uh, when you're doing category creation is the fact that some of your competitors uh, are going to try and actually capture it as well or, or, or claim flame to it. You know, uh, in, in many ways, it's uh, who's first, you know, who's first, uh, <laughs> who's first, uh, who's first to, to, to play this thing and who's the first person to talk about category. But um, one, again, you know, one sign, one clear sign of, uh, of success is when others are saying, oh, well, you know, we, we, we we're also we also want to be part of this uh and so what happens is eventually you know you you have two three competitors who who start using the same semantics the same taxonomy that you uh created and put out there in the market uh and that's a great thing it's not it's not something that should be considered a negative quite the opposite it's good to have competition uh it's good to be first to 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 the market's mind for sure uh, but when after that, you know, after that happens, when when your competitors are, are are jumping on the bandwagon, that's a sign of success, actually. So let me move on to signs of success because, as you, as you said, I mean, this is a this is a long journey. Yeah, I mean, there's it's not exactly crossing the desert, but you know, there's there's a long process, and um, there could be points where oh, I'm just going to uh, overload myself on Moses analogies, but you know, there, there could be a whole series of points where in this process of, of, of designing, articulating, testing the category, that people may be unsure about whether or not they are making headway in this, in, in, in this journey. So how, 
how how do you know when a category has been created? You know, like what 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 do the successes look like as that category becomes increasingly material over time? Right. Well, you you'll know when it's been created when there's when you do start seeing reports around it. But that's really the end game. But there are there are signals and signs before uh, that you're on the right track that things are going well for you. You know, one of them is is you know hearing your competitors again use your language and your taxonomy and talk about, you know, the same category as well. That's a clear sign, uh, you know, competitive mentions, uh, but also, you know, when analysts start writing or, or, you know, producing research that talks about or uses, again, the terms that and the taxonomy that you're using, that's a sign of success. Uh, another sign of success, quite frankly, is, uh, you know, inquiries uh, going to the analyst uh, increasing in volume uh, around the category. And, and, you know, this is about customers or super consumers starting to, or potential super consumers starting to go to the analysts and, and ask them about, hey, you know, this vendor's talking about this category, the way they define the problem, you know, we feel the pain, that's what we're going through. Uh, what do you think about their point of view? Does it hold water? You know, and you can find about, you can find out about these, uh, you know, the volume of inquiries and the, the content of the inquiries that are going uh, to the analysts. You, you can see, uh, you can see it in reviews. Uh, so if you're, uh, you know, if your customers are writing reviews and they're starting to use category language, your category language, that's a sure sign that, you know, something out there is working and is starting to, to have traction. Uh, you know, analyst quotes is another good example. Uh, you know, I think, um, you know, and, and quite frankly, going to the analysts and asking them like, hey, you know, are you seeing traction with, with our point of view, with our category in the market and letting them tell you, you know, yeah, actually, uh, we are, you know, we're taking more inquiries. We're seeing more customers discussing this. Um, so there, there are, there are signals, you know, way before, uh, you know, a category becomes formalized in a in a report, uh, which is the end, you know, the all and be all of, of, you know, you've arrived from a category perspective. Uh, there are many signals, uh, some subtle and not some, some not so subtle, uh, that you're making progress, that you're that you're pushing forward. That little by little, you know, the the religion is spreading, so to speak. And I think there's something useful about this idea of of, of signals that that prefigure the the maturing and the and the and the, the establishment of this new category. That not only can they give hope to to stakeholders who are, who are advocates of this new category, but also, of course, these are the things that 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 buyers industry analysts and investors will also be looking for you know they're they're also looking for these sorts of things especially the ones that are more publicly available these are the kinds of evidence that will allow you to enroll people as as partners in this journey to build new new evangelists to gain followers for the for the journey yep. um, let me I'm, I'm tempted to try to, to to wrap things up a little bit by by directing people back to your back to your book and to the Jerome Pino website where also they can get in contact with you and explore more about this approach. But what else would you say that organizations should consider when they're starting off on this journey? Obviously, downloading your book, this seems like a super useful first step. But but what, what should the following steps be? Uh, I think they should. I, th I think they should think very seriously about, you know, that aspect of uh, change management that we discussed. Can the organization really come together, turn around and, and pivot to this new business strategy? That's very important. Number two, are they, are they willing to listen? Uh, are they ready, willing and able to listen a lot more than they're going to speak to the analyst? Uh, are they capable of doing that? Can they really be thinking in terms of collaboration with the analysts versus, you know, oh, let's try to convince them, let's try to convince them, how can we convince them? Uh, so, the, you know, and then think about resources, uh, think about, you know, um, the fact that it's a long-term endeavor, right? So it's not something that you can do and in three to six months say, ah, you know, forget about it, we're, we're, we don't wanna do this anymore. Uh, we're going back to just sheer competition because that's damaging, right? You've wasted a lot of time in the process. And, and, and from an external perspective, you know, not just the analyst, but the market as a whole is gonna look at this and say, well, what are they saying? You know, that they're, they're different, now they're back to, to being better. Uh, so I, I think, you know, you need to consider all these things as, as any time when you're making a, a significant business, uh, strategic business shift, I think. It's not, it's not any different. 
you know, there's a certain also, you, you know, what's your, what's your risk tolerance? You know, so one of the advantages of CCAR, of course, is that from a category per, uh, creation perspective, you can de-risk that real quickly because, you know, you start talking to analysts and they're like, hey, this stuff doesn't fly. You're not making sense. You need to rethink that. Then you need to go back to the drawing board and say, okay, do we really want to pursue this when, you know, the basic key analysts haven't vetted the, the general concept as a whole? Uh, so that's an advantage of, of you know, of, of using CCAR methodology. Um, but yeah, I think these are all things that, uh, you know, business leadership through, should, should consider before, uh, before making the, you know, taking that big step. And I do think that this is, an, uh, in a way, a crucial difference between the approach that you're outlining and the way that so many organizations would view category creation, is that for, for many organizations, category creation has been a task that they themselves are, that they, inv that they invent it. They go into a closed room with some flip charts and they try isolated from the world to try to develop something and and really what they come out with is you know a, a sound by a form of art which may not necessarily echo the conversations that customers uh, investors industry analysts channel partners whatever may not echo the real the, the real conversation yep. and so i think a lot of what you're talking about is really pointing out the necessary foundational work that has to be done before one can create a category and Absolutely. I think you're also pointing out that category creation is, in fact, an, an ongoing, reflexive, exploratory, world-building activity. Yeah, it's not some, you know, uh, tablet of stone uh, coming uh, uh, coming down, but it is like the almost the shaping of a collective oral history, the integration yeah. of different uh, the different uh, viewpoints. And in that way, building something which is like more resilient, has deeper roots, is drawing on more of what the different stakeholders are being are being observed. I suppose it also poses to me, I've always been attracted by the idea of calling this category co-creation yeah, mm -hmm. rather than category creation. But do you think, and yet that phrase hasn't really caught on, do, do, how far is this an activity of co-creation? And how far is it something that actually requires an evangelist to be the agent to, to, to push it forward? Yeah, well, I think all of the above, right? I mean, as we said earlier on, uh, category creation is an outside in uh, approach. It's an outside in way of thinking. And the analysts are a critical part of that outside that you're bringing in when you're co-creating uh, you know, th th this new category. So yeah, you're absolutely right. It's not about hanging out in an echo chamber thinking how great we are, but it's really about going out there, again, being very willing, very able, very capable at listening, pulling in the right people, figuring out which are the right analysts and which ones are not the right analysts to bring into to the fold and, uh, and help you bake the cake. You know, that's the analogy I always use. It's like, help, you know, have the analysts help you, you know, bake the cake with them. Don't just show them a finished cake at the end of the day and say, hey, now you can bless our great new category. Look how wonderfully smart we are. Uh, so it's about working and collaborating with them and, and other uh, external uh, market uh, entities very, very early on. As you're developing your point of view, as you're developing your problem statement, uh, as you're developing even slides, you know, very tactical things very early on, bring them in very, very, very early on. The more you do this, the, the, the more likely you are to, to eventually figure out who are really the ones who are going to become your, what I call category disciples, the yeah. ones who really will have a stake in helping you, um, you know, evangelize this to the world, basically. And as you pointed out, that's not for every analyst. For some analysts, it's not going to be, you know, compelling. For others, it is for various reasons. Find those folks, uh, find those, those intelligent men and women and, and enlist them in the army, because at the end of the day, that's what it is. Jerome, I think on that optimistic note, I might I might draw the conversation uh, together. I'll just remind people again, Jerome Pinot, uh, we will probably put this in the description uh, when we when we upload this. Uh, com is the website to go. Any final thoughts from you before we before we wrap up? No, I'm I'm uh, you know thank you for this uh, discussion. I think this is this is really great. Um, I, I you know I adore AR. Um, 
it's one of my great passions. And I think, uh, you know, there's an opportunity to really leverage it. You know, I, I, I think of AR as, a, as the, the world's largest Swiss knife, right? So it's really, CCAR is really all about, it's really all about figuring which of the widgets, which of the tools you need to pull out of this AR Swiss knife to, to completely support category creation again, uh, uh, you know, uh, to help you drive again, you know, category design, product design and company design. So I hope more and more leaders and more and more companies and brands will really at least, you know, think about thinking differently. Think about thinking differently, uh, not only around category creation, but around how analysts can really help you uh, succeed there because okay. they can. Jerome, thank you so much for your time. I'll look forward to speaking to you again. Thank you, Duncan, for the opportunity. Much obliged. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Speak to you soon. Take care.